Hello, everybody. I am Vivian Schiller. I am the executive director of Aspen Digital. We are a program of the Aspen Institute. Welcome. And thank you for joining us for Disinfo Disorders. This is our series of deep dives into the mis and disinformation crisis. We're running these talks in conjunction with our Aspen Commission on Information Disorder. Today, I am very, very pleased to be speaking with Steve Hayes. He is the CEO, co-founder, and editor of The Dispatch. It is a digital media publisher with reporting and commentary on politics, policy, and culture informed by conservative principles. He is the author of two New York Times bestsellers and is a Fox News contributor. Today, we're gonna to be talking about right-wing media, which of course is not a monolith. We're really gonna talk about that a lot. But understanding the range of information presented from, say, the very much fact-based uh, dispatch, which Steve is a part of, to what I would call the fantasy-based OANN, for example, is critical to understanding public opinion. So uh, Steve, welcome and, uh, and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Good to be here. Yeah, great. Okay. So first, um, and uh, don't mean to start with a quiz, but uh, this, this quiz question is a means to an end. What does dispatch reporting say about who is the rightful winner of the presidential election last November? Joe Biden. Thank you. Joe Biden. So that very fact differentiates you from a lot of other media outlets who you may get lumped in with when people talk about conservative media. Very much. Um, yeah, we, we were doing reporting on this um, starting on election night. We um, immediately engaged our fact checking team to look into in a serious way, the claims that were made about election fraud and irregularities um, and churned out a series of, I think, very well reported, highly authoritative fact checks that left no doubt that Joe Biden was the rightful winner of the election. Right. So, um, right. So let's, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about those uh, who don't necessarily uh, see it that way or are not presenting it that way. I mean, but let's, let's just back up for a second. So we know that it's natural for people to seek out news and information that aligns with their values and beliefs. We all would like to believe that we are impartial, we read information and draw, draw our own conclusions, but more and more people are either attracted to or frankly via their social media platforms, given the uh, algorithmic targeting are sort of fed information that comports with their worldview. So this is, a, it's, this is the news ecosystem is very different than it was say a couple of decades ago, or frankly, even a few years ago, more extreming, extreme perspectives are rising in popularity with, Amer with Americans. Um, so can you briefly describe your point of view of how politics and to a greater extent, the polarization we're seeing has changed what we think of as conservative media? And you're welcome to sort of draw lines around <laughs> conservative media. I don't mean to lump you in altogether. Yeah, no, I mean, look, I think that's a, a really important question. And, and one of the things that we did when we launched the dispatch in October of 2019 was to try and purposefully push back on this idea. Um, we, we said in our, our founding mission statement, what we're here to do is to provide factual information. We're here to provide the truth. And we told our readers and prospective members, you're not gonna agree with us all the time. You shouldn't agree with us all the time. We test our own assumptions regularly. We'll test your assumptions regularly. And I think that alone, look, I think that this is a problem that uh, afflicts both the left and the right, but we've seen it in a particularly pronounced way on the right in recent years where there is a premium put on affirmation uh, instead of information. And just as you say, people are looking for their own, you know, looking to, to confirm their preconceived ideas of what's right, of how the world works, and they're seeking out information that will, will do that or seeking affirmation. And we stood against that sort of from the beginning. Now, we're, we're open about the fact that we're on the center right. You know, some of us are, I'd say, sort of more traditional conservatives. We have some libertarian conservatives. We have some people probably center left. Um, so we have a wide variety of views on staff at the dispatch. Um, but, but one thing that we're united on is our eagerness 
to actually do the reporting, to, to look at wh where the facts lie. And then we can have big bloody policy disputes about what to do with those facts. But there has to be some common understanding of what the facts are in order for, for our uh, democratic republic to work. So what does it mean to be a conservative media, a fact-based conservative media? In other words, how does that manifest itself um, in your reporting and how is that different from others who might say, we don't lean in any direction, we are impartial reporting? I mean, you may disagree that, we can have a separate conversation about whether there's such a thing as impartial reporting, but let's start at least by what this means to, to you at the dispatch to be conservative. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's probably a common view among the folks who work at the dispatch that the, the overall media lean to the left. If you, if you think of the, the media landscape, the political media landscape um, as a spectrum or a continuum, our argument is you start in the center and you move to the left, and that's a very, very crowded space. There are lots of choices from sort of mainstream outlets like the New York Times, ABC News, the AP, move over a little bit more, you get some of the, the cable networks on the left, you get digital native companies like BuzzFeed, Vice, Vox, what have you, and you get sort of niche open left-wing magazines and things like that. If you start, if you do that same exercise and you start in the center and you move to the right, we think there's a pretty significant gap in the middle. Um, then you get to places like the Wall Street Journal editorial page, National Review, um, Fox News, of course, is, is the, the behemoth. And then you go over from there, it gets pretty fringy pretty fast. The other way that we look at this is if you ask the people starting the center and moving to the left, what do you do? What do you exist to do? Most of them will tell you as part of their answer that reporting is a key part of their mission, but sort of across the, the, the left. I would say on the right, you don't have as many media outlets, people who run those media outlets who would put reporting as a core part of their mission. That's not to say that there aren't really good reporters on the center right, there are, they're fantastic reporters, not just people at the dispatch elsewhere, at, at Fox, at National Review, at the Washington Free Beacon, for, in, for instance. But there are fewer and fewer places that are devoted to reporting uh, first or as a core part of their mission on the right, I would say, than on the left. And what that means is you, you get to a certain point on the spectrum and, and it is just churning for affirmation. And that's a problem. So when you talk about, so you are a reporting entity. And when you talk about reporting from the center right, is that about, is it, what is that about? Is it about story selection? Is it about who you're reporting on? Or is it about your sort of columns and opinion? Yeah, you know, I would say it's, it's, uh, it's significantly about story selection and the kinds of questions we ask. I mean, we don't come in and say, we don't consider ourselves on a team. Um, we're not on the red team or the blue team. Uh, we want to find out what's true and what's happening. Um, and we want to report that to our, to our readers and to our members. So that's sort of the, the primary goal here. We, we have commentary writers and analysts, Jonah Goldberg, David French, and others who also come from the center right, but they're writing their opinions based on facts. They're not, these are not hot takes. They don't see something on Twitter typically right. and crank something out an hour later that they know is going to get us lots of traffic. We don't care about traffic for traffic's sake. We care about traffic if it, as it, a means to an end so that it, it will uh, help lead people to join the dispatch and pay us for the work we do because we think we've established credibility, but we don't care about traffic for traffic's sake. And that I think is something else that makes us pretty yeah. unique. We'll just ask different questions. I mean, you know, having been a reporter now for 25 plus years, I can't tell you the number of times that I've been at a press conference and I look across at my peers and maybe not all of them, but many of them asking are sort of one version of the same question or come in with the same objective, th the same thing they wanna pull. And I will have an entirely different question based on just my different outlook, based on my background, based potentially on where I grew up, my experience overall. And I'll ask those questions. It's not a thumbing the scale exercise though. That's very important to be clear. And we are not a partisan operation. We, we, don't, we aren't on the Republican team or the Democrat team. We come with different views, I think, than most people in the mainstream media and those inform 
our questions, they inform our reporting, they inform our analysis, but we're not in the business of, of picking winners and presenting information that only corresponds to one side or the other. But you're obviously trying to appeal to a conservative audience. That's why that's why you exist. Yeah, right? I mean, I think we, yeah, sure. We, we provide a contrast, we think, to a lot of the reporting that is done by mainstream outlets. I mean, look, sometimes we do the very similar reporting to mainstream outlets. Um, but other times we'll have a different approach to, to a question or a different understanding or, or ask different questions, start with different premises and report things out from that point of view. So your assertion earlier was that um, a, a lot of the news organizations who, if they were here with us right now, would say, we are not center left. We are objective journalistic enterprises, like you mentioned in the New York Times. Um, I don't know, can't remember if you mentioned the Washington Post, even BuzzFeed. Uh, like I said, they would probably not assert that they are center left, um, but your feeling is they are center left, and that is based on what? Um, aside from the aside from the editorial page, which we recognize is you know right. at the New York Times is 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 progressive. Yeah, I would say twenty five years of doing this. Um, you know, going. I went to Columbia's Graduate School of Journalism, graduated in the late nineteen nineties. Had a great experience there for the most part. Um, Two hundred and fifty some odd students in my class, many of them went on to, to occupy important seats in the mainstream media. And as far as I know, there was one other conservative or libertarian, and she went on into sports reporting. There were lots of people, some of them my very good friends, when we would go out and have beers and wings at night and get into big debates about the issues of the day, we'd have big arguments. And their opinion for them would come out, they were. As yeah. often as not, yeah, it was me against the world. And look, that's okay. I'm not necessarily being critical of them, but it, it was just a very different approach that they took to a lot of these issues. And, you know, I had, I had believed uh, even before I went to Columbia that that was the case. Certainly that experience solidified that in my, in my mind. And then as a reporter over the last 20 some odd years, I think that that's become abundantly clear. And I think, look, just to, to go to the New York Times, just, just as one example, there are lots of very good reporters in the New York Times, of course. I think some of the very best reporters on a variety of beats work at the New York Times. I also think there are people on the New York Times who in some ways are more ideological than I am writing for the front page of the New York Times. And the average news consumer can't make those distinctions. You know, I read for bylines. I study this stuff. I live in this world. So I'm paying very careful attention to that. But for the average news consumer, they might see something on the New York Times, the front page of the New York Times, that I think has a tremendous ideological slant, because I've been reporting on the same issue, next to you know, a piece by one of the best respected reporters in the world, somebody like a David Sanger or a Jonathan Martin on politics. Phenomenal reporters, but their pieces sit alongside other pieces that I think are sometimes uh, ideological pieces. Do you think there is, can you point to any news organizations that you would say are an impartial? Again, I know that's a fraught word. And is such a thing even possible? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's, it's, it's um, important to try. I mean, you don't want to be partial in, the, in, in sort of a literal sense. You don't want to be partisan. Um, I think it's good for journalists and journalistic outlets to try to present information as objectively as possible while at the same time recognizing the biases that each of us carry. Um, well, I think the Associated Press, when I read something in the Associated Press, I generally believe it. Now I've got questions about some of their reporting in different areas, but you know, I think the Associated Press does a really good job. Um, as I say, I read more for bylines than anything else. So, you know, in each of the major outlets, uh, each of the networks, I could probably give you a handful of reporters who I believe every single thing that, that they write and I'm in awe of how effective and, um, and full their reporting is and others who I think, I don't believe that person. Yeah, Let, let's, let's turn uh, back now to right, right of center. Uh, we'll just call it right of center um, reporting. So, um, which, you know, begins with you know, in the continuum from the dispatch all the way to, you know, again, those who might not be really in, not fact-based like you are. So how do you 
attract an audience at a time when for a lot of conservatives, it's about Trump and they are listening to Tucker Carlson, they are listening to OANN um, and who are inarguably spreading and amplifying this information. How do you, how do you find, a, are you able to find an audience that has not gone sort of over to lost touch with the reality, but still interested in sort of more traditional conservative values? Yeah, I mean, the, the way that Jonah Goldberg, who is my co-founder, the way that we talked about this at the beginning was, you know, there really ought to be, it's important that there is that kind of an audience, right? It isn't the case that everybody on the center right is just looking for affirmation or everybody on the center right is willing to believe the kind of stuff that Donald Trump was pumping out. Things that sometimes were true, often were not true. So it's important sort of for the country that there's a big group of people who don't believe this and who don't follow that. Um, we thought there was a big enough group that we could give them a place to go. And I think, you know, part of the reason we've had the early success that we've had is because that group is maybe even bigger than we thought. Um, you know, we have a hundred and almost 150,000 subscribers, people on our email list. We have, uh, you know, approaching 27,000 paying members. That was the, that's, four and five times what we had projected when we launched. Um, that might not sound to a lot of people like a massive number, given that the New York Times has millions of, but we think we're making progress. And part of the reason we're making progress is because we're very open about where we come from and we're very open about what we're doing. And as I said, in that initial mission statement, we told people, if you're just looking for what you already believe, we are not the place for you. You're gonna be disappointed and frustrated with us. And, you know, what's been really, uh, I would say, gratifying about this experience, a couple things. One is we don't get people who are looking for that. Maybe it's because we've sort of warned them. If you're looking for affirmation, you won't just find it here. Um, so we haven't had many problems with our readers and members that way. They come wanting to be challenged. They, you know, we have a very robust discussion community at the dispatch. So we do a lot of back and forth. We explain to our readers why we've made the arguments we have, why we've done the reporting we have. Uh, we'll answer their questions about where we're coming from. And that all, you know, to us, that that's pretty important. Um, I'd say that's one of the key reasons that we're, um, that we continue to grow the way that we've grown. Well, look, your, your numbers for, you know, a, a small publisher, I'm familiar with those business models is, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's terrific. But if we zoom out a little bit and we look at um, sort of the kinds of mass numbers we see on social media, then of course, you know, it, it, it's dwarfed. So yes. let, let's talk a little bit about that. So this past week, and this is similar to every week, the top 10 performing link posts on Facebook, all but two of them were from conservative media or conservative talk radio commentators, many of whom have been advancing false narratives about the election, vaccines, Ben Shapiro, I mean, you know, you, you, you know the list. How do you think about the role of mainstream media as a source for disinformation spreading on social media? You mean the role of right-wing media? Yeah. As a source of disinformation? Well, I mean, it is, I mean, the numbers, like I said, week after week, this, yeah. is, who, this is who is rising to this top, despite claims of, you know, being canceled. <laughs> it, it's, it's definitely not the case. What, what, what do we do about that, particularly when those posts are fraught with falsehoods? Yeah, um, well, look at the problem. I mean, some of the people, Dan Bongino is always um, near the top of, of those yeah. lists. I think he, he peddles stuff often that's, that's not true. You have outlets like Gateway Pundit and Breitbart and others yeah. that have risen in prominence over the years, in part, I think, because they're willing to give people what they think people want. And for the past five years during the, the Trump era, a lot of that has been driven by Donald Trump. It's what Donald Trump says. I mean, in some ways, he has now become the most important voice, the most important source of information for people on the center right, um, more important than arguably any media outlet that exists. And people move to what Donald Trump says. It's a huge problem. If I had the answer, um, you know, we'd probably have a lot more people uh, subscribing and, and reading our stuff than we do. You know, from, from our perspective, what we can do 
is emphasize to people that what you get when you come to the dispatches, you're going to get the things that are true. And we, we think we have a role pushing back on some of that, to be sure. When you look at some of the things that we've spent our time fact checking, some of it is reporting or I wouldn't say reporting, commentary, falsehoods that come from center-right media outlets um, that are amplified by places like Newsmax and OAN. Um, that, that's, I think, one thing that we can do and have been doing. And, you know, we hope that we have some credibility with audiences on the center, right, in part because we've worked at places like Fox News and National Review and the Weekly Standard. It's not the same as it was 10 years ago, but um, we think that helps us reach some of those audiences with our fact-based reporting. Yeah. You know, one of the things, no doubt, that one of the trends, no doubt, that you've seen being having been a reporter for so long is that many politicians now, many Republicans have adopted the tactics of, uh, of, of disinformation just as part of their toolbox for political campaigning. Now, to be sure, for generations, probably for millennia, politicians have, have often said things, they, what, what they need to say to get elected, but there seems to be now a almost Im immunity to being fact check or or corrected and just and that the approach now which let's let's you know let's call it Donald Trump perfected is if you speak a lie and you get called out you double down and yeah. you attack the person that's calling you out so how does that impact the way that you do your reporting it makes it harder i mean being totally blunt it makes it harder we have because we do so much reporting you know, we develop sources just like anybody else. We spend time talking to people across the political spectrum, certainly not just on the right, but on the right and the left. Um, and nobody likes to be called out when they're saying things that aren't true. Um, so when we fact check somebody, we'll get blowback from it. They don't necessarily like to hear it. Um, I, We still have, I would say we still have, we're, we're able to get our, our phone calls returned um, in a way that I find encouraging, again, not just on the right, but on the left, even if we're, we're calling people out, even if we're pushing back on some of the BS that we get from, from politicians in, in, in particular on the right, we'll get, we'll get phone calls or we'll get, um, you know, they'll engage with us when we talk. So as long as we're continuing to, to do that, I think we're in a good place, but there's no question that it makes it more difficult. I mean, if you look at the events of the past couple of weeks in which Representative Liz Cheney spoke out against what many of her colleagues in the House GOP were saying, you know, telling the truth. Notice I didn't say, I think telling the truth. She was telling the truth about what happened. And you have a lot of people who were attacking her on that basis and countering her with things that aren't true or amplifying stories that that are BS that we've reported on that we've looked at. You look at her replacement, Elise Stefanik, a representative from New York, and she was, you know, within days of la launching her candidacy, doing Steve Bannon's podcast. Well, Steve Bannon, he's on record. He's spoken openly about flooding the zone with expletive so that people don't know what's true and what's not true. And she chooses to go to him to make her case. She, she's been on other podcasts that have the same function. Um, you know, that, that makes it more challenging to be sure when you're, when you're trying to call people out and you do it often enough, she, her office, we did a, we did a story on, on her and the, the changes that she's gone through over the past few years from a relatively moderate Republican regarded as very thoughtful, was a policy director uh, under Tim Pawlenty's campaign. Um, to being, you know, really a, uh, a MAGA amplifier and repeatedly saying things that, that, that aren't true, or at least allowing people to, to, to believe that what she's saying is that she, she backed this fake audit in Maricopa County that's taking place. It's fake. It's not a real audit. They've already done this. This is all for show and it's nonsense. And she said, new number three Republican in the House of Representatives said, yeah, I'm, I'm for that. I think it's important that it's happened. Well, you have to, you have to call that out. I mean, what, what, what are we doing in this business if we're not calling stuff like that out? 
but it's become a purity test, right? A Trump purity test, sure. um, and, and, and really a purity test about again who the, what we started this conversation with, who won the election last November. Yeah. And for politicians, we see like a Liz Cheney. You can't if you don't meet that standard, then you're out. And the same for uh, a lot of conservative media. Um, you know, their their audiences will go after them. Donald Trump will go after them. Has Donald Trump gone after the Dispatch? Uh, he has not, as far as I know, and I think That'd I be a good thing. I help your uh, <laughs> help he, your awareness. He went after me repeatedly when I was at the Weekly Standard, and he's gone after Jonah Goldberg, my co-founder, uh, many times. But yeah. I don't, think he's, I don't think he's um, swiped us anytime yeah. recently. So this is a kind, a, a little bit of a grim picture, I have to say, um, in terms of um, the. Uh, current state of and future of reality-based, fact-based. Uh, I mean, we're, we're not here to talk about, you know, media on the left. I'm going to leave that alone. But fact-based conservative, conservative media, um, you know, there are only, you know, a, a very few handful that I'm aware. I'm sure there are many very, very small ones of, of any significance like the, the dispatch that are towing that road. It's got to be, uh, it's got to be a difficult place. Um, I want to just uh, wrap up uh, this session and with gratitude for the, uh, the time you're giving us, Steve. This is super helpful. But with, a, with one um, final question, and this is a question we're asking everybody, um, uh, this final question for everybody that we're talking to as part of this series. So these discussions, as I mentioned, are intended to inform the members of our Commission on Information Disorder, of course, as well as the general public. They're in the process now of uh, deliberating, they are a nonpartisan, actually bipartisan um, commission. Um, is there anything about the conservative media landscape or the conservative media uh, viewing, watching, listening public that you, think the, that you think the commissioners should know as they prioritize issues and then move towards um, identifying solutions for government uh, around the issue of mis and disinformation aimed at government, the private sector and civil society? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I guess I would say, without revisiting the, the question about the, the center left media, um, I, I would say it's important not to dismiss the concerns that people on the center right, that conservatives have had for years about things like media bias on the center left. Um, because I think having, having lived through that and having seen it, in part that gave rise to the, the lack of trust that we see from people on the center right. If you look back at you know, several prominent examples of um, places where the media really did seem to be thumbing the scales or circling the wagons or picking up. Pick your metaphor. I mean, I would point obviously the Dan Rather controversy, um, George W. Bush in 60 Minutes would be would be one. There was another in the 2004 election. Um, the New York Times did a series of reports on um, the Al Qaeda weapons depot that was taken over by bad guys in Iraq and used it for a couple of weeks to really beat up George W. Bush and suggest that the the, the war was being poorly run and what have you dozens of stories, as I recall, up to election day, and they basically dropped it. I think it was mentioned two or three times in the subsequent years. Well, people like me see that and you think, that's not, that's not accurate reporting. I mean, if it was an important story the day before the election, it should be an important story after the election in a general sense. The, 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 this latest shooting in Ohio, and I don't mean to belabor the point, but the latest shooting in Ohio where the 16 year old young black girl was shot by police. The New York Times put out a 30 second video on Twitter that failed to mention that she was lunging at another girl with a knife. Well, that's important information. And it makes people who are who come to these things skeptical say, well, what else, what else aren't they telling me? So again, without litigating the extent of media bias or whether people believe it, it's a fact that people on the center right have long believed it and, and have not um, felt heard, to use sort of a postmodern framing on it. And I think taking that serious and saying, okay, well, let's do some, let's do some real internal looking at what that, what that means and where we got. 
even if you think that the examples that I'm giving are, you know, a one in 10 or a two in 10 in importance, what they do for folks on the center right, including bad faith actors, is they provide examples. This is what, and, you know, this is why you should never trust anything that comes from the New York Times or what have you. And for people who are busy living their lives and driving kids to hockey practice and, you know, working in an ER, that matters. You know, they don't have the time to chase this stuff down. So I would just say on that sense, you know, my, my first piece of advice would be just at least take it seriously. Think about it. Talk about it in a serious uh, and, and respectful way. And then on the on the center right, I mean, I think part of the problem is, is you've seen this. It's hard to explain because Donald Trump has become a source of so much information over the, the past five years, as you pointed out, Earlier, I mean, you you see other Republican politicians mimicking that behavior and giving exclusive interviews to, I think, outlets that shouldn't be credible. They shouldn't be getting exclusive interviews with with senators, with representatives. And um, I'd say keeping an, an eye on that is is really important because you know you you start with. Um, something that is in the gateway funded and it makes its way to another less reputable source. And then a Senator gives an interview to, to Breitbart and people are say, well, that place must be credible if Marco Rubio is giving an interview to Breitbart um, and it sort of builds on itself. And I think that's a, that's a real problem. Yeah, literal echo chamber. Um, Steve Hayes, Dispatch, thank you so much. This was a great conversation. I really appreciate you spending uh, time with us. And uh, yeah, so great to have you. Thank you so much for the conversation. Thank you. Bye-bye.